priority one. 53 year old male with trouble breathing. He had 294 Crittenden Way, apartment number one, Rutherford Crittenden Road in the dead end, right? We're learning more tonight about a deadly car crash at speeds alleged to be over 100 miles per hour. This morning, at least one worker is hurt after a massive fire raging at an oil well site. In a four vehicle crash, which happened on the weekend, a, a scene many are describing as unbelievable. Almost died doing doing what after what the historic mill there Ryan, burned down overnight in a died horrible after family crash. Falling down the basement staircase. Those incidents kind of tug on you. Calling MCR for a patient report. Our days are always different. We can't just, it's not a nine to five job, it's a 24 hour shift and you know, if we're not running calls, we have to do something. What I enjoy most about my job is the fact that I'm helping somebody in their worst time or state. Um, it's a very thankless job, but I know in my heart that they are grateful and thankful for what I do. Fluid for uh, re fluid resuscitation and If we um, happen to work on a holiday, my kids have grown up learning that the holidays aren't always on the day that they celebrate them that they're on the day that we can be together as a family. I grew up in a small town in Nebraska and my dad was a volunteer firefighter and I mean it was the you know traditional town of 240 people that the town siren went off and everybody rushed to the fire hall and, and I remember thinking it was cool and I can remember riding my bike pretending I was going to the fire and um, but I don't think I had a good grasp of what it really meant until um, I went to paramedic school and worked in EMS for a little while. And that's when I really started to be able to wrap my head around the, the serving others and helping the community and making people's day be a little bit better. I was actually into the career a little bit before I really had an understanding of why I wanted to do what I did and what it gave me. The most challenging aspect of my job is the loss, the traumatic deaths, the unnecessary deaths, the un unnecessary pain. Um, we see things that are very difficult and um, are hard to get through. Over 25 years ago, I was pulling out of a Kmart and I had my children in the car and I witnessed a woman being hit by another vehicle and she just laid in the road by herself. I uh, stopped the car and I went to her side. I didn't know anything at the time. I didn't know what to do, but I was there and I held her hand. She eventually died. I saw her obituary in the, in the um, newspaper and I went to the family because I didn't know her name or anything. And they were so grateful that she didn't lay in that road by herself, that someone cared enough to be there with her until the um, EMS got there. That feeling and the, from them and knowing that I was there for her really touched me. And I just, because I didn't know what to do, I wanted to know what I could do for people in that state. I had no idea that it was gonna to get to this level, but at that time, I just wanted to learn. There was a family that had twins. They were, uh, I think they were about a week old, and um, dad slept with one on the couch, and mom slept with the other one on the other couch. It was Christmas Eve, and they got up Christmas morning, and dad had rolled over on one of them in the night and suffocated the baby. And, and we got there and started the resuscitation, but we knew there was, it had been too long. So um, we did what we did and, and we let the parents know. And I, and I remember the, the look on mom's face when, when we said, you know, hey, I'm sorry, there's nothing that we can do. It's best that you spend a little time um, with your child and, and say your goodbyes. And the first thing she did was she's, I thought she would break down. I thought she would have a total emotional meltdown. And she just thanked God for sharing that child with her for a week. 
I was like, whoa. I mean, that was just really, it was very moving. Many years ago, after I had a call with an infant that was murdered, I remember a supervisor telling me that it's okay to cry. It's when you don't cry anymore that you know you're done with this job. The unfortunate thing is I try to make myself cry now. Um, and I, I began to turn to alcohol and um, I didn't have to drink, but when bad things happen, I turned to alcohol. I didn't know how to cope. These awful situations, these traumatic scenarios that they're going to, um, ends up being normalized. Biologically, your body has a hard time processing that, much less emotionally, and uh, the brain-body connection is, is really in flux during those times. Over time, those really build to where first responders mentally are able to be prepared and ready to face these scenarios, but their bodies are saying, hey, this is not normal, um, and it's sending all sorts of neurochemicals and um, other things are going on that start creating havoc for the first responders that show up. So they have an intense amount of cortisol and adrenaline going through their bodies at all times. So they're doing that for 48 hours if they're firefighters or 12 or 10 as, as law enforcement or in, in the EMS side. So thinking about doing that for that period of time and then coming home where they're in their safe zone where like their tones aren't gonna go off, they're constantly waiting for that to happen. When these traumas happen, you have neurochemicals that are released, right, that are trauma-based, your fight, flight, or freeze. And so when that is activated, uh, you're less likely to use your logical mind, you're less likely to respond in ways that are appropriate. Um, and so constant activation of that wears out your nervous system. And so oftentimes what first responders will find that they're happening is that they're coming home from work and their nervous system is still activated or something that in regular life wouldn't activate their nervous system because it's so heightened and sensitive, it's being activated. So they're responding in ways maybe through anger, um, maybe through alcohol or drug use, um, but they're responding in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. Trauma is like a little ball, right? And in and of itself, maybe this trauma, they go on scene and there's a fatality, for example. Uh, you're able to handle it, you're able to deal with it. In and of itself, it's not a big deal, but you throw it in the bucket. You go in another scene, another fatality, something else is going on, you throw it in the bucket. And over the course of your career, you start throwing it in the bucket. Well, eventually you throw a ball into the bucket and that bucket's full and you knock out two more balls, right? And so all of a sudden, something that you thought you could handle and that you have handled in the past has really started to impact your outer world. We're not taught how to cope with things. Um, I've been in this for 25 years and back in the day, we weren't given those tools. We had critical incident stress debriefing on big calls, but there's all those little calls, the fatal car accidents, the SIDS babies, the, you know, the child abuse, the uh, domestic violence. So much of this we have to deal with on a daily basis. And we had no way to cope. We had no way to deal with anything. Shift starts at 7 a.m. I usually leave my house around 6. I try and be here early. Kiss the girl, kiss the dog, grab coffee, and head over and listen to a podcast on the way over here. Kind of calm my mind, get ready for the shift. You know, just for emotional support and then just the trust on the fire ground, you know, and just day in, day out. You know, just the nonverbal communication is just the little cues we know in each other. and. And uh, yeah, I can't hardly put into words how important it is. You're sleeping in the same rooms, you're working out together, you're, yeah, like you work up a sweat and stink. Um, like it, it gets pretty personal. We're trained to go solve everybody else's problem. 
And so that's a lot of weight and a lot of responsibility. And for ourselves, we then identify as problem solvers. If we can go out and solve the world's problems, then we inherently believe we should be able to solve our own problems. It is incredibly common to see our emergency personnel not talk about their calls. And part of that is because they don't want to traumatize their partners. Most people, it's, it's the most effective to just let them talk. You know, just let them say how they're feeling when they want to say it. Some of them don't want to talk about it and um, they play it off as, you know, the, the macho card and it doesn't bother me. And it's like, eventually we'll be like, yeah, it does. We know it does. We've all been there. It's always kind of been a stigma like that is kind of a sign of weakness when it's really not. And I mean, it's just important because if you don't find a way to de-stress it, it just builds up and it gets at you and it also affects everything in your life. I wish we could all be trained in this to recognize the, the, the clues and the, the changes in people so that we could prevent the suicides. The suicide rates are higher than line of duty deaths in, in fire and in law enforcement. co-workers that have commit, committed suicide. Divorce is, is not uncommon amongst us. Affairs are not uncommon. We see the worst of the worst together. We might be smiling on the outside when we're hurting on the inside. Peer support is something that's um, rapidly growing in the fire service. We identify people that want to be resources within the department or, or peer support team members, and they go to this training academy. And we spend time learning about the stages of grief and, and how to respond to people that are suffering. So we have a group of members, I think there's four of us right now at Windsor that are peer supporters, and we're, we've agreed to be available 24-7 as well. We have business cards with our phone numbers and we give them to the members and there's flyers around the station. And anybody that's struggling can call us anytime. And, and we'll either talk with them or meet with them if they want to meet and have coffee or if it just needs to be a phone conversation, we're there for that. Or if somebody is really entering a, a crisis type situation, um, we'll get them whatever resource they need. Part of that training was just understanding when you should go for help, uh, the many different ways. So if I don't feel comfortable with talking to one of the other firefighters just because I work with them every day, there's some things that I might not want someone else to know there's other resources to where you could actually go through counselors or other things. We've developed peer support teams in the fire and EMS industries, which we never had before. In my treatment, I learned how to meditate, how to do, yo you know, do yoga, how to, they gave me tools to deal with things that um, I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. What does it mean to be a firefighter? Civil service, community engagement. Just to be the person that is able to help someone out on what could be their worst day. <laughs> They're like, ha ha, we got Taking it. <laughs> care of uh, people in their times of need, whatever that need might be. We take great pride in just being able to make someone's day better. There always is some sort of a problem that is stressing someone or causing them an issue and to be able to make it a little bit better for them and leave knowing that we made a positive difference in that person's life at least for the day. A paramedic to me is someone who's very caring and loving and someone that is selfless, that considers others before themselves. Deep breath. If we're going to risk a lot then you know it's going to be for another life and that's a risk we're willing to take. Whatever emotion they're feeling is normal for someone in the fire service. Whatever it is, they need to not deal with it on their own 
and, and lean on their brothers and sisters in the fire service or the professional help that's available to all of us now.